the more that we are separated from the way that we've lived as humans for hundreds of thousands of years, the more problems we have. In this podcast, I had the pleasure of talking to my friend Shannon. She's well known on social media as a contortionist. She does all sorts of amazing things balancing on her hands, including shooting an arrow into a moving target of Joe Rogan's head. And I actually just saw a video of her shooting a flaming arrow while on her hands with her feet. She also has an interesting story regarding a recovery from veganism, how she got into veganism, what sort of things swayed her in that direction, the health problems that she had with veganism that improved when she included meat in her diet. She had resolution of acne, many other things that some of you may be struggling with. And she has a story regarding birth control, how that affected her attraction to certain men versus not. And so there are lots of interesting anecdotes from this story that I think you will all benefit from. And she's a fun, interesting woman to talk to. She's currently eight or so months pregnant. So it was awesome that she took the time in Costa Rica to talk to me in person. I think any of you who know someone who is eating a vegan or vegetarian diet and struggling with health issues may find this beneficial. That person will hopefully find it beneficial. Any of you out there who know someone or are taking hormonal birth control or struggling with skin issues can also find benefit perhaps from the anecdotes in this podcast with the resolution of Shannon's acne when she went to an animal-based diet. And as I mentioned on previous podcasts, this is something I've heard multiple times in the last few months uh, there was another woman at the farmer's market here in Costa Rica that I met who also told me that her acne got significantly better when she cut out things like grains and beans, pasteurized dairy, and is now eating meat and fruit, raw dairy. Food changes are quite powerful for so many of the health issues we are told by Western medicine that are not able to be fixed. So I hope that this is an enjoyable podcast for you guys. Shannon, thanks for coming on the podcast. Thanks so much for having me. I got to start with this question because I just don't understand it. I don't talk to a lot of women in my life, which is probably why this is so confusing to me. Um, <laughs> I'm surrounded by dudes. I'm in Costa Rica. I surf a lot. Um, I wish I talked to more women. I don't understand why women are so enamored with salad and mm. so afraid of red meat. Like, what, how, how does this happen? It's just a diet culture. I believe, you know, you jump on TikTok and through all the mainstream movies and media and we're just painted this image of health, which so happens to be, you know, inclusive of salads. It's like 90s diet culture mentality that is still um, infiltrating our society now. I don't know the obsession with salads, but salads health is uh, kind of the... <laughs> and what's the fear with red meat? Why are women afraid of red meat? Like what do... What do women think is going to happen if they eat red meat? Are they going to get fat? Are they going to get too <laughs> muscular? Like, I don't understand. I think meat in itself uh, just feels very masculine. Ah, <laughs> it does. That makes sense. Oh, I can't remember when, what movie it was, but you know, it's, it's like this stereotype of you're going on a date and the man will order a steak and the woman will order a salad. Or like fish or chicken. Yeah, yeah. So like red meat is masculine, but fish and chicken aren't so masculine. That is uh, what we're being told, what's being portrayed. It's, it's absurd. Yeah. It's so interesting, like how these things get into our consciousness from the media at a young age. And I think a lot of people don't even understand the way that we're being programmed. Mm. I mean, do you remember, did you grow up in Australia then? Yeah, yeah. Okay. And did you remember growing up in Australia and like, were you aware of this programming that you were getting in terms of like, this is what girls eat and this is what boys eat. Like boys play with trucks mm -hmm. and girls play with Barbies and girls eat these foods and boys eat these foods. Is that, is that the way it is? I think it's also what's being modeled to us through, you know, our parents and our communities and, um, if you spend a lot of time on TikTok, um, like I've been recently, there's this uh, stereotype of like an almond mom. So it's oh, like... I didn't even know about this. Tell me more. An almond mom is essentially just the moms that are, you know, very restrictive with their calories and, you know, eating lots of salads and, um, you know, avoiding these like fatty or high cholesterol foods and all of that. And so that behavior is being modeled to children. Or like if you're growing up with like an almond mom, you know, that's all you've kind of learned but it seems to be a very common thread because it is like an archetype. Yeah, the almond mom. Right, so I was recently in Los Angeles at Erewhon. Mm -hmm. Do you know about Erewhon in Los Angeles? I have seen content about it's like, it. It's like, it's great. It's a really cool grocery store. They do a great job of like curating very high quality things, but they also are good at catering to sort of the LA ethos, right? Mm -hmm. The LA zeitgeist is oat milk and almond milk. And so- we're building an animal-based smoothie. You don't think I can say that? <laughs> no, it's so good. It's so good because America, not America, Australia has that similar culture that feels copied from American yeah. culture. So yeah. we're making, what's cool is I don't even, 
I'm surprised everyone wanted to do this, but they want to do a smoothie with me to collaborate. So they do these, they do these like smoothies in with Erewhon. Like Haley Bieber had a smoothie at Erewhon and but they're very expensive. They're very expensive, <laughs> but they're full of good things. And so they, they want to do a smoothie with me. And so this is coming guys down the pipe. We're doing a smoothie at Erewhon. Hopefully I didn't let the cat out of the bag too early, but as we were like formulating it, it's going to have all animal products. And I was at Erewhon recently in Los Angeles and I was like, <laughs> doing testing with one of the managers. We were testing the flavors and there were a bunch of people in line. It's, it's a lot of women in line. And mm-hmm. I was trying to get someone to like try the smoothie and multiple women were saying, I don't do dairy because mm-hmm. I'm going to put raw milk or raw kefir in the smoothie. And it was, it, these are probably just almond moms yeah. in line at Erewhon. And I, I, it's like, it's, I'm not being judgmental these women. I just hope that they're thriving and I want to understand like maybe you could, I don't know. It'd be interesting to get your perspective. Like, how do you think we could help women like understand that this, that almond milk is not as nutritious as regular milk? Like mm-hmm. where does this come from in, in the female ethos? Like I have a younger sister, but I've never actually asked her about this because she's not really clued in nutrition, mm-hmm. but you've been in this world for so long. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's what I thought was healthy many years ago. Like the almond milk, the leafy greens, um, lots of grains, like this veganized, <clears throat> pardon me, um, concept of food. And I don't know really where that comes from because it's not true. It's just like through media, you know, gut health issues, eat more greens, you know, you want to be healthy, eat vegan. And yeah, it doesn't really impact men in the same way. I don't think I feel like women are really targeted with this like narrative, but I don't know where it necessarily comes from by the root cause but it is yeah very very prevalent <laughs> isn't that interesting that that because you were you a vegan or vegetarian for a long amount of time yeah i was a vegan for four and a half years close to five okay yeah it's a long time. <laughs> <laughs> i only lasted seven months Jenny. in mm. vegan world wow but i was a raw vegan so i was like the holiest vegan mm. and oh uh, i went uh, down that path, there's, there's a certain type of vegan into the the fasting, the raw foods, <laughs> alkaline. I was very holy vegan. Seven months. I was very skinny. I, so right now I weigh 165 pounds. And when I was a raw vegan, I weighed 140, 145, like yeah, same right. height, just like 20. And this was muscle. So like 20 to 25 pounds of muscle different between mm-hmm. raw vegan Paul and meat eating Paul. Mm-hmm. But isn't it interesting that you spent four and a half years as a vegan and you're not even really sure how you got there. Oh, I definitely know where the turning point was. Okay, tell me. Uh, the the abundance of vegan Netflix documentaries. Oh my god! <laughs> they got me because I was a young, like, teenager, you know, and, and my empathy was being targeted. Um, to transition me into veganism and I genuinely believe that I was doing the best thing for the the planet for my health and for the earth uh, the planet the earth oh my gosh um yeah and it's just lies it's it's just manipulated and it, it's a story that really playing on your emotions to get you to transition and yeah I was left with a whole range of health health concerns but yeah it was the vegan docos they got me Fuckers. Like many people. <laughs> they, they've gotten a lot of people. And we were talking about this before the podcast. We need like a, a, a real truthful, even keeled meat documentary that shows people, hey, these vegan documentaries are not telling you the whole mm. truth, right? And mm-hmm. so hopefully um, we're going to be able to create that in the future. It's something that I'm really excited about, mm. about doing um, with my team here is like creating a meat documentary. So you guys can stay tuned for that. There's a meat documentary coming, hopefully, but <laughs> it is true that there's, if you look on Netflix and I wonder if this is because I want to hear about your, your journey through veganism and your health stuff. But do you think that like, I mean, is it conspiratorial to say, or to suggest that like the media is just much more amicable to that mm-hmm. sort of a view than to a pro meat view? It just seems like that's everything gets promoted. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> I definitely feel a bit more conspiratorial about it. And I understand when people think that that's not the case at all. And it's more just like profit driven, but yeah, I think that there's something more to pushing the vegan diet amongst people. Yeah. If you want to go full conspiracy, you could do it. You know, go full conspiracy. Show me. If people, well, it just kind of makes sense. You know, people aren't um, as healthy. They're, you know, a little bit weaker. They're not, 
as like embodied into their masculine fi- feminine dynamics and if you're just unhealthy you're easier to control <laughs> you know? there's something to that right like <laughs> have you yeah because we know that nutrition affects behavior mm. it's very clear that yeah. nutrition affects behavior we see that with humans that i mean i don't know this has ever been documented in a study but at least my observational mm. uh my my sort of observational take would be that when you eat less meat, sometimes people get more irritable. I mean, yeah. it seems, I mean, it's almost like a meme that, that, that vegans, and look, if we're vegans listening to this, we, I want the vegans to be healthy. Mm. I'm just, this is an observation that I've had that the vegans are kind of angry and like irritable. And I think we know that like everyone, hopefully listening to this has had some experience where they eat something that's nutrient rich and they feel different, mm. right? You might feel more peaceful. You might feel more energy. Maybe you feel more even keel emotionally over time. I've heard people say that with an animal-based diet with more meat, right? But the opposite could also be true. If we're deprived of nutrients, it changes the way we feel mm. and it could definitely make us more subservient and mm. sycophantic, right? Yeah. And I mean, exactly, exactly. You're so right. And there are studies, you know, that showing that vegans have like a little bit lower testosterone and, you know, when more you don't depression. have, yeah, yeah. When you don't have like strong people upholding society, it's like, you know, there's room for the powers that be to come in and uh, impose regulations and rules and uh, all sorts of things upon the society. That allow them to sort of control people in yeah. a better way. Yeah, yeah. I wonder if let's, this is very conspiratorial. Yeah, um, but who am I? <laughs> what do I know? No, but like, I wonder if, I wonder if <laughs> people in government like want, and this is any government. Like theoretically, if you were in a government, maybe you would want to have people who were subservient and listen mm. to what you said, and you might view higher levels of testosterone as a, as a bad thing. And maybe mm. you would think like, oh, this, I mean, we know this, we were talking about this before the podcast that mm. I did a reel on Harvey Kellogg and mm. the Battle Creek Sanitarium in Michigan. And the fact that he developed cornflakes to like essentially dissuade people from masturbating. Cause he had these mental patients in this in sanitarium in 1894. Mm. And lo and behold, humans have a libido. And I guess he was having problems with people like masturbating. You, mm. Humans shouldn't masturbate. We shouldn't be sexual beings, right? This is a horrible thing. And so he developed this low nutrient density food that apparently helped with that. Like mm. that, if that played out on a broader scale in the population, we could totally see, oh, okay. People are thinking for themselves less. They're less strong in general. Maybe they're less mm. willing to like make decisions that go against the norm. If they don't have, I hadn't thought about it. that's, it's interesting. But why would they want that? <laughs> <laughs> I think obviously they're easier to control, right? I mean, we see this, so who knows? So we don't know if that's what's going on. <laughs> so who knows if that's what's actually going on? Who knows? But maybe. It could be, it is a possibility. It is a possibility. Certainly it seems like the climate change narrative has been foisted upon us and that everything now is done. <laughs> What's funny? <laughs> oh, it's just the internet. You're really picking into all the pieces of the vegan, the climate change um, narrative. It's just like, uh, yeah, please oh, keep going. We're going to piss people off. <laughs> this is definitely going to piss I'm trying not to get censored on YouTube. We'll see. But like, yeah, it seems like the climate change narrative has been foisted upon. It's just been, it's been integrated. And now everything happens because of climate change, right? Like, uh, there's more heart, atta- heart attacks happening. People are less healthy because of climate change. Every every environmental change that we see is climate change. When mm. you know, anyway. And there's and the craziest thing to me is that we're not allowed to discuss any alternative views. Mm-hmm. You were saying that some of your stuff is getting censored. Yeah, yeah. I share news articles. Um, yeah, I just share news articles about stuff related to like vaccine or cedars or whatever, and that gets taken down off Instagram, for example. So it's like even re posting official sources is getting taken down. Why is that? <laughs> I don't understand. And that's what I was saying about Battle Creek Sanitarium and cornflakes and masturbation was that, that Instagram deleted that post saying it was mm. false information. And I thought that's, that's like history that's written in Wikipedia. That's like, that's mm. like, as far as I can understand, like that's real history with John Harvey Kellogg and that's why cornflakes was developed. But it's just strange to me to see how media is changing beneath our feet. And I hope that this conversation just makes people a little curious about what they understand and believe to be true. Mm. And like, how do we know what's true when sort of social media giants and like tech companies are, are writing 
Mm. The, the overarching narrative. And thank God that Elon bought Twitter in some ways. Mm. I mean, what do you think of that? I think it's um, great to have a platform that allows a little bit more freedom of speech. You know, it's not perfect and some people still aren't allowed on the platform. Mm -hmm. You know, there's still people that are censored from there, but, you know, it is a step in the, the right direction. Yeah. Okay, so let's go back to your veganism. You shot too many <laughs> vegan documentaries. Yeah, and you do a really good job of dissecting the information and sources that are coming from these vegan documentaries <laughs> because, you know, they're painted as truth and light and the statistics at times are manipulated to paint that narrative and then you get people on social media coming to your page or coming to my page and, like, parroting this information without realising that, you know, Statistics can be manipulated, <laughs> especially when they put it in movies and they have the really theatrical background music. <laughs> right. This is important for people to understand that, that. I mean, I can think of The Game Changers, the recent documentary, and there was a statistic in there. I forget the actual one because I haven't seen the documentary in a few years, but they were saying something like people that eat meat, eat meat have like a 400 percent increased risk of X, Y, Z. And to the general public, that sounds very bad. Mm. But what they don't understand is that that's an observational survey being done. And there's an association there. Mm. There's no actual real experiment being done. And I think this is, it's really quite just misleading the way these statistics are being used. And mm. there's so much bad science and nutrition. It's so hard to navigate. Mm. People don't understand. And why should they? Because they're raising kids or they're lawyers or engineers or artists and they don't have time or necessarily the, the interest to understand that an observational study is just a correlation that can't be used to draw a causative inference. It's, it, it's misleading. Again, mm -hmm. in my conspiratorial brain, I'm thinking, oh, they're doing this purposefully because mm -hmm. it gets done so often. Mm -hmm. And I just think, wow, how is anyone supposed to navigate this? I mean, how are you supposed to navigate that as an impressionable, empathetic woman in Australia watching vegan documentaries? Mm -hmm. Exactly. Exactly. And I mean, I went through this stage of becoming vegan, then I was vegan at like four and a half years. And then I got to the point where I was like, something is not right clearly in my own body with all the symptoms that I'm experiencing. And then I began exposing myself to information and resources that didn't just directly like affirm what I already believed mm. with the vegan mm -hmm. diet. Right. <laughs> so I think the more um, conversations that we can have around these topics and yeah, I guess the more space that is available to be able to you know, talk and challenge these ideas, the more change and progress that we can actually make. <laughs> My patients are getting better. Check out this review on Lifeblood from Heart and Soil Supplements. I'm a psychiatrist and have followed Dr. Saladino's work for a while now. Much of my thinking around nutrition has been informed by his animal-based approach to diet. Recently, a patient of mine with long-standing obsessive compulsive disorder mentioned to me that her latest blood work indicated she was anemic. Her primary care doctor suggested that she start taking supplemental ferrous sulfate. She agreed to try Lifeblood from Heart and Soil Supplements instead and has not had an intrusive thought since. I love this stuff, you guys. Lifeblood contains spleen, liver, and blood. Spleen is the most bioavailable source of heme iron of any of the organs. Blood contains all sorts of unique growth factors, nutritional components, and immune cells in it. And liver is, of course, the powerhouse of all powerhouses for humans. All of our supplements at Heart and Soil are sourced from grass-fed, grass-finished cattle in New Zealand. They're packaged in glass. These are the finest desiccated organs on the planet. And did you know that the synthesis of dopamine in the human body is iron-dependent? So if you are iron-deficient, many women become iron-deficient because they're not eating enough meat and organs and having menstrual cycles every month. That can affect the formation of dopamine, a key neurotransmitter in the human body. So in this case, it appears that supplementing with liver, blood, and spleen, things that are hard to get unless you're getting them in a desiccated organ supplement, really help this patient. I'm so glad the psychiatrist shared this review. And I fully believe that organs will be very beneficial for many of you throughout your life. Obviously, none of this is medical advice. See your doctor about any ailment that you have, but including organs in your life will definitely upgrade your health in so many ways, energy, libido, mental clarity, Overall mood, outlook on life, and emotional stability are all things that we've seen people improve on by including organs, either fresh or desiccated, like we make at Heart and Soil in their diets. You can find us at heartandsoil.co. Our mission is to help you reclaim your birthright to radical, optimal health. Now, what, what sort of, like, tell me about your vegan journey, because I think some people, <laughs> when they go vegan, they feel better. Yeah, yeah, for did, a little bit. <laughs> did you feel better for a little bit, or? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> 
I did. And looking back now, it's because I just cut out all the junk foods that I was eating as a teenager. <laughs> okay. Because a lot of teenagers do eat a bunch of junk food. Yeah, yeah. And then you went to, what were you eating when you were vegan? It probably changed over four and a half years. Yeah, but I mean, I'm was training like an athlete. I was a circus performer. Like I was always really health conscious and I was always really into um, food and cooking. So one of the main criticisms I get coming onto my page, because I created a veganism as a scam video and it was a bit theatrical about my experience as a vegan. And I got a lot of backlash and it got like, you know, 18 million views kind of thing. So I didn't expect it to go viral. My vegan story got out there. Um, but one of the main criticisms I get from these vegans is people telling me that I just didn't eat properly. And that's just not the case because I was a really great vegan. I was eating like, um, for breakfast, for example, like chickpeas on toast with spinach and avocado. And then I'd have like yogurt and seeds and nuts and berries and then like lentil stew, for example, for dinner. And that's like all the nutritionally dense vegan foods that they recommend you be right. eating, you know? I, what if people, <laughs> I mean, I guess what else people want you to eat as a vegan if you don't do yeah. it that way? Like, yeah. I was eating like a lot of healthy whole foods and I still ended up with um, deficiencies and deteriorations. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And you mentioned that you were doing circus performing. Yeah. So talk about that a little bit because we can loop it into the, like, how did that, how did your athletic stuff go over the course of your vegan years? Mm, um, I think initially I felt better. I felt lighter. I felt felt like I had more energy within like the first year. Like I felt great for like two and a half, three years. Interesting. So yeah. there's a little bit of a tail on that for people. Yeah. 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 I initially had a really good um, boost and then slowly but surely I kind of normalized the symptoms and you, you just tolerate more. You don't, you're not as aware. And then all of a sudden my like uh, perspective shifted and I realized what, well, I've been normalizing all these symptoms for like, you know, six months now, a year now, like something needs to change. What symptoms were you getting at the time? <laughs> um, so many weird ones, like major anxiety, PMDD. Like I thought that I was genuinely like having a mental health disorder at the time and you know when I had meet again it, it really subsided really but, yeah like anxiety yeah like people don't think of that as a nutrient deficiency yeah anxiety was a really but it improved thing. when you had me yeah that's yeah a, that's incredible it's super important people to hear that because I think so many of these psychological illnesses mm. people like so many of the illnesses we have in western medicine or in the western world mm. most people just believe they're broken and they have bad genetics and I mm -hmm. hear people talk about anxiety all the time and I think I see that as autoimmune and, and neuroinflammatory. Mm. So it's interesting that, did you have anxiety before your um, vegan years? It was definitely like, it. there was a significant increase when I was vegan. Okay. You know, I really like genuinely believe that I had like chronic anxiety and needed medication and like help. And it feels so like weird and embarrassing like talking about it now, but it's like there was definitely that correlation and there was no like specific cause of the anxiety and PM, PMS symptoms, you uh -huh. know, before your cycle, like that hormonal, like irritability was like so extreme when I was vegan, like looking back at it now. And it's like, it's just not the case. That's not normal. And uh -huh. um, yeah, I normalized it. <laughs> did that improve as well? Did the premenstrual syndrome or the premenstrual dysphoric disorder, the PMDD, did that get better yeah, when you yeah, added me? Like the stability of mood. <laughs> like, yeah, right? I just felt like a stable human being once I began like actually nourishing myself. Um, so yeah, that was a, a big one. Do you remember the first time you <laughs> ate meat? Um, I, yeah, yeah. I first started incorporating eggs and then a little bit of fish. And then I had the liver before I had the steak. <laughs> okay. That's the way to do it. Was there like, maybe there wasn't, but was there like a euphoric moment where you, and when you ate the liver or when you ate the eggs or these nutrient rich foods came back into your diet? Did you feel it? What is so bizarre to me is the emotional response that happened immediately when I was eating meat again. Like I was cutting up the steak and bawling my eyes out because intuitively I knew that it was like the right step to improving my health, like incorporating meat again. But like I had just been so programmed to believe um, <laughs> that meat was like hurting, you know, the planet and really bad for like our ecosystems and the animals. And like it was this emotional um, tie that I had. Like, I felt like I was a bad person for eating this meat, even though it was like the best thing for me at the time. So yeah, the first time I had meat and the times afterwards, like I just had to work through the, the guilt that had been programmed into me. And I was like crying. 
all those vegan documentaries just like getting yeah, in your head. Yeah, yeah. And even though I'd done the research and known that you know those vegan documentaries are misleading, I still had that like programming wired into me. Um, it's so hard to program <laughs> ourselves, isn't it? Like it's yeah. crazy to think about all the things that we believe that we don't know why we believe them. Mm. I mean, I talk to people all the time and they, different things come up. You know, I'll tell people like, an interesting one is I'll tell people, I don't use toothpaste. Mm. And they, they, their eyes get wide like this. They're like dinner. So I, they, we don't use toothpaste. I'm thinking, why do you use toothpaste? Mm. And they, they just don't even understand. What's in your toothpaste? <laughs> so, yeah. I can sit it. Yeah, it's so interesting to talk to people <laughs> and to just say to them, like, I don't use toothpaste and to see what happens. <laughs> and, they, and then to ask them the question, like, why do you use toothpaste? And they, isn't that, it's usually a question back to me, like, isn't that necessary to clean your teeth? And I think you don't even know, you know, and you're using it. And then, like you said, what's in your toothpaste or mm-hmm. what's in your deodorant or what's in your skin moisturizer or what's in your, I mean, what's in your anything, right? Where like, is your food coming from? Yes. All the constant questioning. We just yeah. don't know. We just accept the yeah. standards that we accept. Yeah. And people, you know, I think people will have the same reaction if I say, I eat a lot of red meat and they don't eat red meat or they don't eat a lot of red meat. Isn't red meat bad for you? And you think, mm. well, wh- why do you believe that red meat is bad for you? And people, I just think that there's a lot of us who, b- a lot of us believe things and we don't know why we believe them. And mm. I'm sure that I have beliefs that are unexamined mm. and sort of untested, but it's interesting to think as a human, how many of the things that we use to navigate our life every day are mm. decisions based on programming that isn't really ours. Totally. I laughed because I, I recently went to visit my parents and I was spending some time with them and I was eating like eggs every day. And I knew from my dad, you know, isn't cholesterol bad for you? And I know that he's just like referencing an ad about eggs that happened on TV like 20 years ago. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's like cholesterol is bad. Narrative is being pushed so much. It's still pushed now, but like, you know, they used to have ads on TV about it. About how bad it was. Yeah, yeah. Did, did you ask your dad, why do you believe that? Or what do you think... Do you think that that's the programming that he has? Does he know? I just told him that, you know, the the narrative changes and, you know, there's updated information now. And, um, yeah, it's hard. <laughs> it's hard when somebody's um, believed something for so long. But My yeah. parents are both 72, <laughs> and it's hard to help them make changes. Hmm. I've almost stopped at this point because they're so... I think that at some point, if we hold a belief long enough, it, it just becomes harder and harder for us to change it. Mm-hmm. And so how old were you when you watched the vegan documentaries? Um, I would have been like 16. Okay. Yeah. Impressionable. Yeah. And then what, how old were you when you went vegan? Uh, still like 16. I okay. went vegetarian for a few months and then decided that, <laughs> you know, that wasn't good enough and dairy yeah. and the eggs were also yeah. as harmful. And- mm-hmm. Yeah. And then did you, and you started eating meat around 20? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, a little bit later. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. It's, so that's, I guess it's, you can imagine how hard it would be for somebody who's much older mm. to have been vegan for a long time to, to change those perspectives. So I guess maybe in this place, thankfully your brain was still somewhat plastic yeah. in your early twenties and you escaped what could have been a bad path. Mm. But what do you, what would you say to someone? And I don't know if there's, many vegans or vegetarians watching this, but I think that this ethical empathy argument is talked Mm -hmm. about a lot, right? This idea that, that eating animal products is not kind to animals. Mm -hmm. You must've gone through this with like the tears coming down your, your face and everything. Mm -hmm. Like, what would you say to someone? How do you, how do you think about that now? I would say that I prioritize my health and my fertility and my, um, nutrition over, and animals life like I chose to prioritize it like I know a lot of sick vegans who just kind of tolerate the symptoms because they care more about the animals than they do for us but you know my fertility was really like um a priority for me but I also went down the rabbit hole of like you know not all meat is considered equal like a factory farm animal is not the same as um you know my local dairy farmer that you know can sell you the whole cow and um support that nose to tail nutrition and um provide like a species appropriate diet for the animal like they're two very different products essentially at the end of the day so yeah when I was in the position to be able to support um like I'm very privileged but I went through that um, journey of only supporting like organic local farmers and you know trying to source the most uh, ethical meat products that I could 
Yeah, it's interesting. There's this great book that I read a number of years ago called The Tracker by Tom Brown. And he's this, this man who grew up in the Pine Barrens of New Jersey. And he was apprenticed to this Apache Indian and got to like have this amazing childhood where he basically ran around the woods and learned Native American mm. ethics, fighting tactics, hunting tactics, and in engagement with the land from this Native American sort of at, at like the nadir of like, you know, like, like the end of like the Native American sort of like history, right? Because it was probably the end of that Native American's family and like their, their cultures are being, you know, being lost in this time. I think he was in the 70s. So it was a couple of, it was like a couple of generations ago that he was doing this. And, you know, many people know now that on the reservations in the Southwest and other parts of the United States, like Native American traditions are pretty much being lost. So it's really mm -hmm. cool to see this Apache, um, this Native American Apache man passing down his knowledge to, that man's grandson and then Tom Brown, who were friends together. And there's this amazing scene in the book where Tom Brown kills his first animal by hand. So it's a deer, he's nine years old, he's in a tree with a knife and he drops mm -hmm. out of the tree and hits this sort of lame fawn and kills this baby deer. And he brings this deer back to camp and this Apache Indian man who they call grandfather says, why are you crying? Cause he's just sobbing. And he says, oh, and I'm paraphrasing. I don't remember the exact interaction, but he says, oh, I'm so sad that I killed this animal. And this Apache Indian man says something that's always stuck maybe with me, which is that in order for something to live, something else must die. This is the way of life. And he says, when you understand that the life in a blade of grass is the same as like the life in an animal, then you realize you can't exist in life without killing things. And this is something we should be grateful for and understand that we're part of this cycle of life and death. But I've always felt like these ethical vegan arguments or vegetarian arguments, mostly the vegan arguments, are sort of this like, false, this false prioritization of like neurological evolution, just because a cow has a brain and walks on four legs and moves, who's to say that the life force in that cow is different than the kale plant that you're killing? Mm -hmm. Or what about all of the microorganisms in the field that you're disrupting and the worms, like the cow's life is more valuable than a mouse's life. And it's like, mm -hmm. well, I mean, I think we would as humans, like a reasonably empathetic human, we feel bad about just maliciously killing a mouse or a vole or a snake. Mm. Why do we prioritize a bigger animal? It's kind of just this fake human construct, right? And yeah. I think that like this idea of buy kills and the fact that when you take a field or a forest that you have to chop the forest, you're killing all the trees. So all of that life force is going back to the life force well or wherever it goes. Mm. And then all of the animals that depend on those trees are gone. Then you have to cut the trees up and you have to till the soil and then you have to kill everything that's in the soil that you're tilling. And then all the rabbits, all the voles, all the mice, all the badgers and you know snakes and all these lives are disrupted, all the rabbits. But we're saying, no, that's not bad. Mm. But what is bad is killing a cow that grazes on the grass and lives a life and will die you know, as part of their life cycle anyway. It's, it's, it's interesting. I think that a lot of the, the vegan and vegetarian ethos and ethics are well-intentioned. They're just not, they don't seem philosophically mature to me. Mm -hmm. Or like finished, right? Like it doesn't make sense. Yeah, it's that disconnection with our food chain and with these processes. Yes. Um, yeah, yeah, you basically just said everything. <laughs> but it's true. You bring up a good point. That it, I think that if more people hunted, yeah. they would understand this. If more people lived closer to the land and saw how food was produced, they mm -hmm. would understand this. And so I think that one of the things that keeps coming up for me in my own life as I'm thinking about where humans are in 2023 is that the more that we are separated from the way that we've lived as humans for hundreds of thousands of years, the more problems we have. And there's this great, there's this great celebration of like technology and technology does amazing things. I mean, people go to hospitals and they have technology that can be life-saving in the moment. But at the same time, I think technology, and we're always developing technology, spheres are technologies, bows and arrows are technologies, fires are technologies. But this, this idea that all progress is good. It doesn't make sense. It's a, I don't think it's always good for mm -hmm. humans. Like I think that things that pull us away or that cause us to have amnesia or forget where we've come from as humans, they, they often result in more suffering long-term. Like we're not mm -hmm. eating the same foods. We're not living in the same way. We're not walking outside in the forest. I just think about, I mean, now that you're here in Costa Rica, you get this, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm sure you got this in Australia because I saw your videos in the woods, but like I think that humans being in nature, this sounds so trite when I say it, but I think it's so true. Like humans being in nature is irreplaceable. Mm. You just can't do it. You can, I don't think humans can function well without that. Have you spent any time in like a big city recently? Uh, I briefly spent some time in Madrid on my way here and in Dubai. 
<laughs> okay, what would you buy? Like, <laughs> how long are you in Dubai? Oh, uh, just a week. It's it's certainly not for me. It's but like, a week in Dubai, okay. More than enough time. How did you feel in a week in Dubai? Pretty ungrounded. Hey, I'm not really like a city person. It just feels like an amusement park for adults. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, I think it kind of is, right? Yeah. Or sort of, yeah. I went to New York recently <laughs> and it felt like, I felt like outer space. Mm. It just felt like there was this, like I must be attached to some tether, mm. you know, to like the ship, like the mother ship. I must have some tether because I'm in this completely alien environment among mm. cities and buildings and concrete. And, and it's very hard to get connected to that. I mean, maybe that's just my personal construct, but like I literally went to the East River every day and stuck my foot in the Hudson River or the East River. Just to get some connection. Just to get some grounding, it's gross. I mean, you know, my, one of my friends is, is from New York. He's like, that's absolutely disgusting. But I was like, all I could do. I mean, how did you, did you think about that in Dubai? Did you feel pulled to like nature? Is there any nature to get in Dubai? Oh, uh, there's like a man-made uh, beach that we were staying by. Which okay. Is, which is very odd. But yeah, I think I knew that I wasn't going to spend too much time there. So I just kind of stuck it. Uh, but mm -hmm. like what do you think that people living in these cities can do like back when I was in Australia and I was trying to re-establish that connection with my food like I had the opportunity to visit the farms that I was getting my meat from or my produce from but like for these vegans for example they can't just go to like the tofu farm or like the tofu farm the soy farm or right. like the the Amazon to get their acai like they can't go to these places and see the processes and same with people who are living living in cities like they don't have the opportunity to see the process for themselves the disconnect you know gets greater what do you recommend these people do to reestablish that connection with their food i think they have to come back in a, in a nature and like yeah go into forests and go into jungles and and understand where their food is coming from i, I think that I mean, don't you think every human should do that? Like, yeah. shouldn't we? Like, I think this should be taught in schools. And that's a whole separate conversation about the school system. But I think every human should understand where their food is coming from. Like, I think if you ask, if you ask children, if you ask most children, like, where does the water come from when you turn on the faucet? Like, oh, it comes out of the faucet. Like, where does that come from? We don't know. Like, humans don't know where the water in the faucet comes from. Oh, it's in an aquifer, which is up on the mountain and it's treated with these chemicals. Mm. Where does the water in the aquifer come from? Well, it comes from snow melt or rainwater or it's diversion of a river. Mm. And in order to do that, this other town is like a drought, you know, and Las Vegas shouldn't even exist. And certainly Dubai should never freaking, like, where does Dubai, like when you turn on the tap in Dubai, where the fuck does that water come from? <laughs> like how many people in Dubai know where that, I don't even know where the water comes from in Dubai. I don't know, I should have asked. It just magically appears like, where is the fresh water that puts the water out of the faucet in Dubai? That's crazy. And I think that, yeah, I think you're right. The people in cities are just so disconnected from where their food comes from that they, we should really think about that and might help them understand this cycle of life and the way they fit into the, you know, the way that all of this fits in the world in a broader sense, because I don't think people should stop living in cities. I mean, some people want to live in cities and they do good work in cities and they create things that are beautiful. And, but I think that my assertion would be that if you live in a city, and I've done content on this, you live in a landscape that is very foreign mm. for your genetics and your history. And I hope people will be curious enough to consider the possibility that just living in a city long term doesn't always lead to good mental health for humans because you might actually need to go into nature. And if it's New York City, go to Central Park a lot, mm. but understand that that Central Park is like the lifeline to like a much broader set of wilderness that I think people need. Like they can't, mm. we can't exist without those things. And it's just a, it's a reflection of the fact that this overarching sort of paradigm for me is that though I've changed my perspective on things over the years, I, I eat carbohydrates now, I eat fruit, I'm not strictly carnivore, even though I wrote a book on it. Um, but I think that one thing that I've seen throughout the whole journey for me has been that when humans vary, when we differ, when we get off track from things that we've done for hundreds of thousands of years, oftentimes in the name of progress or thinking that we're doing something better, mm. we just almost inevitably end up getting worse, right? Mm. It's problematic. Yeah. It always comes back down to the simple, simple things. The simple things, right? <laughs> so what's your diet like now? Um, I would just say that I eat real whole foods. It's been pretty interesting throughout pregnancy, especially as like a first time 
mum, like the cravings that I initially had in first trimester were like not of optimal diet. <laughs> okay. Like what kind of things were you craving? Well, I think that when we go through this transition from maiden to mother, you're essentially saying goodbye to like your childhood self and you're stepping into this new role mm -hmm. um, as this provider and this nurturer. And in that process of saying goodbye, like I emotionally was like craving all the foods that I had uh, enjoyed as a child. So like a lot of the like oh, vegan wow. foods that I was craving um, came back and like junk food and just like fairy bread and like all these. What really is fairy like, bread? <laughs> it's like a typical Australian like birthday party snack. It's just essentially white bread with a bit of butter uh -huh. and then some sugar rainbow sprinkles on top. Okay. And I didn't indulge in, in all my cravings, no, but that was quite interesting to navigate through pregnancy because it's like clearly this is not um, optimal for Right. Me. <laughs> interesting. See, yeah, as, as a man, I'll never get to experience like what the first, second, and third trimesters of pregnancy are like mm. in terms of the cravings. Mm. But I've heard this, that women in pregnancy can have different cravings. Mm. You think it's a psychological thing. or mm. Because, I mean, what, what in your body would be craving fairy bread? Like, oh, there's a nutrient in fairy bread mm -hmm. that you need. And no, I think that was all like emotional stuff coming through. Now it's like definitely more uh, geared towards my, I guess, standard diet, which is just like healthy, real foods, mm -hmm. like fruits, um, meat. Essentially, I've been eating a lot of ground beef now that I'm here again, which is good. We have a lot of honey, cacao, um, some grains, some rice and sweet potato and stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just like real food. Real food. <laughs> Yeah. And how's the pregnancy going? Are you eight or not, eight and a half months pregnant now? Yeah. I'll be 35 weeks tomorrow. Okay. Yeah. And I saw a video of you on Instagram doing like a handstand like a yeah. few weeks ago. Yeah. Are yeah. you still doing the? Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I still can do it for sure. The balance is there. Um, but yeah, I've definitely started to slow down a little bit as I'm preparing to nest and <laughs> nurture. Uh -huh. and yeah. So how's the pregnancy been? <laughs> I mean, with, do you, mm. do you notice during the pregnancy that the foods you eat affect aspects of the pregnancy or this I, is your first pregnancy? Yeah. yeah. Okay. I, so going back to like the veganism stuff a few years ago, you know, I had all of these like weird health issues, um, not just anxiety, but just like random things as well from like low immunity, like missing my cycle, not having a regular cycle and just like weird things, gums bleeding, blah, 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 whatever. And then I started incorporating meat and liver into my diet. And I was eating raw liver like regularly and I got my cycle back. And I really believe that incorporating meat and high quality foods enabled me to like fall pregnant. I don't think it was a coincidence that I was eating raw liver for like six, eight months before I fell pregnant. Mm -hmm. So that was like um, a major part of like my pregnancy preparation and yeah, I really think that I nourished myself properly to have like a smooth pregnancy because I've had basically no issues whatsoever. I've been really active throughout my pregnancy. Like I wasn't getting morning sickness. I had like small periods of nausea, but yeah, I've been active and moved, <laughs> relocated across the world right. like, in my pregnancy. I've, I've, everything's been really smooth. Yeah. So your energy has been good. Yeah. Yeah. And you're still, like you said, moving and doing yeah, yeah. handstands and like. I think naturally I'm slowing down a little bit as like, um, and obviously like this baby is putting pressure on your bladder and towards the end of pregnancy, you go up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom so you're not sleeping as well. So I think that's like a natural uh -huh. response and why I'm a little bit tired today. But um, yeah, throughout the whole pregnancy, I've been doing handstands, stretching. I was um, shooting bows and arrows with my feet until like 22 weeks pregnant. <laughs> so. I want to talk about yeah. that. Yeah. Let's talk about shooting bows and arrows with your feet. <laughs> so, sure. so for people that don't know, I think one of the first things that I saw of you was you shooting a, a Joe Rogan head <laughs> on a cart that was like moving, that you were controlling the cart that's moving with your hand or something mm -hmm. while you're shooting a bow and arrow. Like, where did the idea for this come from? Like, what is going on with this shit? <laughs> Yeah, yes. Yeah. So I was always into circus performing, contortionism, and the foot archery. And as I was training that up, um, I started doing a little bit more work on social media. And that particular video idea um, was a collaboration with my partner, and we just developed the idea. So for those who didn't quite get the translation, 
Oh we can put the video. Can we put the video in the YouTube? Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. We'll put the video on YouTube. Chance so and Fudatri skateboard at the same time using a remote control car to drive the target and as we cross paths. I shot it. Um, but yeah, uh, that idea is a collaboration. The Handstand Food Archery has been around for a very long time. But yeah, now I'm the Guinness World Record holder for Food Archery. How many yards? Uh, yards, yards. Uh, like 18 and a half meters, which is like 59 feet. That's amazing. Wow. Uh, yeah, hitting the bullseye. Hitting the bullseye. So yeah. like how big is the bullseye? Um, like three, three rounds, like that big. I can't remember exactly the centimeter diameter, but... So it looks like it's yeah. maybe like two and a half inches diameter yeah, or something? Yeah, 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 about that. So hitting a bullseye at almost 60 feet yeah, yeah. with foot archery. Yeah. Well, I could have hit anywhere in the circle, but I did shoot it right in the middle. Right in the middle. <laughs> okay. It's... How, many ti- how many tries did it take? <laughs> like six years worth of tries. Six years worth of tries? <laughs> but you, there was some video on your social media where it was like, I'm doing this for the Guinness Book of World Records and you go and you do it. Mm. So you have to go on a certain day or they like look at it or you were trying for six years and then you finally got it. Oh, well, I think it's taken me six years to like develop the skill to be able right. to do it. But yeah, on the day that I did go for the Guinness World Record, um, I think I did maybe like, I only included three on camera, <laughs> but it was more like, you know, seven shots. <laughs> no, still seven seven yeah, shots yeah. Not bad. how many times did it take to like hit the did you hit the joe rogan one on the it was a balloon like on his face right yeah yeah it was a balloon target joe rogan there's just so many elements to that trick that it's so hard to like <laughs> explain and elaborate yeah. but yeah that's i can't even remember how many exactly it was only a couple of goes and then you got it yeah yeah i'd done a lot of training prior to, to that yeah. did joe know you were gonna do that like no he he followed me like a year before i posted that video and we were just thinking, you know, we have to create a video, like, um, like how can we incorporate him into this trick? Like it's obviously been a big inspiration. His podcast has been like amazing, an amazing tool for learning. Um, and yeah, all the elements kind of came together and yeah. You ever met him? You ever met him? <laughs> no, you not yet. Oh, that's crazy. Cause that was a thought. Well, maybe, maybe some archery one time. Yeah. Yeah. Do some foot archery with him at some point. Yeah. That'd be cool. So, okay. So you were just, you were telling me about your vegan to eating meat, the fertility transition, and you were talking about all the things that were kind of problematic for you when you were a vegan. Mm. And the list was moderately long and you like cut yourself off. Like just, mm. let's just make the full fucking list. Like, yeah, yeah. please tell me everything that was going wrong when you were a vegan. <laughs> it's so crazy thinking back at it now. Yes. It was like, um, the generalized anxiety, I thought that I had a mental health disorder, um, PMS symptoms, a regular cycle. Um, my fingernails were just like so brittle. I'd go through periods of like just losing clumps of my hair, like just like my hair falling out. Um, my gums at times would like bleed. Um, and I generally just like wasn't feeling strong at the end of it. Like I was training, but I wasn't improving. <laughs> in my like mm-hmm. strength mm-hmm. um yeah they're probably like the main ones yeah and I, yeah as we highlighted earlier i just want people to understand that some of these things are not always associated with nutrient deficiencies but mm-hmm. i think that i want i think it's important for people to understand that a lot of these things especially the mental health stuff and mm-hmm. the irregular cycles for females like that stuff is very responsive to diet and yeah. i see it all the time and it makes me i think it just kind of tugs at my heart a little bit when I see a man or a woman talk about anxiety and I think like change your diet. Mm. Did you have issues with acne in the past as well? Isn't oh, there a story course. about that too? Yeah, I had just really, really bad spots of acne. Like Was this during the <laughs> vegan period or before? Or Towards like... the end of my vegan period where it's like, well, clearly something is not right. Wow, okay. You know, I went to the doctors for it and uh, it's so problematic going to the doctors when you're a vegan because they just tell you, you know, you get your bloods taken and they just say, oh, your iron is a little bit low and maybe you'll be able to explain this better than I can because I've tried explaining it to people. But when you go get a general blood test, (laughs) they have like scales for what is normal. And essentially my iron would just come up at like just like the lower end of the portion, but still within like the normal range. But it was like I was clearly so deficient, not only iron, but like many, many, many things. But the doctor just says, you know, it's you're within the range of normal. So I didn't get like um, the help of the clarification that I needed from these regular blood tests. But 
yeah, the acne was like a major one because if there's something happening with your skin, then you know something's not happening um, internally, and it doesn't matter how many products you can buy to try and address it or what they're feeding you. Yeah. And Did you try a bunch of different things for your skin? Yeah, yeah. I, I, it's like embarrassing, honestly. Like <laughs> these cosmetic companies, they're so bad. They're like, um, if you have a, a young girl who's insecure and they're dealing with skin issues or this or that, you're like the perfect target to be sold everything. <laughs> it's crazy to think about. No, it makes me frustrated. So like on a, on a recent podcast I did, probably the podcast that'll come out the week before this one, I was talking about skincare and sunscreen. And in the podcast, I showed a few people from Heart and Soil. Like we had some testimonials of people who had changed to an animal-based diet and had significant improvements with their acne. Um, and maybe in this podcast, if it's okay with you, we can use photos and show like mm. the before. And can it's we use your acne so, photos? It's so significant. It, it's important to show because it, yeah, it wasn't normal. <laughs> it's just something that we're, we're told is normal for like, you know, you're just going to preview or you're like just young, but it's, it's not normal. It shouldn't be normalized acne. It shouldn't be normalized. <laughs> and I, I, I think acne and face stuff is one of the things that's hardest for people because it's, it's how you show up in the world. I mean, mm. if people are overweight and they're trying to lose it or they have acne on their face, like those are probably two of the hardest things mm. because you, you don't even want to go out in public. And thankfully mm. in my life, I never really had bad acne. I certainly didn't eat a any sort of special diet as a kid. I had asthma and eczema. Those were kind of my problems. But it's so interesting to hear your story of acne getting worse with the vegan diet and then improving. So what was the eventual thing that fixed it? Well, what's interesting is that when you go to the doctors or like when you go to like a, a health coach or something online, the advice they give you is to cut out dairy, eat more leafy greens, eat more grains, eat more salads. <laughs> Right. All the vegan foods and it's like it was so incredibly frustrating because this is all that I was eating and I'm still like going through um these processes but yeah I also um was on birth control for a period and then when I got off it that also like exacerbated the um condition I guess and then slowly over time um, just incorporating like meat and liver was a big one. I keep returning back to the liver because I didn't like it to begin with, but I was eating it every day. Um, yeah, yeah, slowly but surely my skin started to heal. So is it, is it accurate <laughs> to say that the removal of a lot of the plant foods and the inclusion of meat and organs led to improvement in the acne? Is that yeah, accurate? It was, like, it was like a six month process of like things actually improving. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. But that was what eventually sort of fixed it. Yeah, yeah. And I still have um like scarring and like some issues with my skin now, but it's not like the same. And you'll be able to see in the photos, like it was like cystic acne and then yeah, it eventually just stopped. Yeah, I mean it's it's so <laughs> striking that and I think this is the problem for people, a problem for people on vegan and vegetarian diets. If you go to a doctor and you're having fatigue or mood issues, I mean if you have fatigue on a vegan diet, they might check your iron. But if you have mood issues or autoimmune conditions or sleep disturbance or menstrual irregularities as a woman or low libido as a man or a woman, and you go to a doctor with a vegan or vegetarian diet, they're going to pat you on the back and say, you're doing the best thing ever. Mm -hmm. We don't know what's wrong with you. This is what I think will happen. Mm -hmm. Because as physicians, we're not trained to think that this could be a problem for humans and that mm -hmm. eating too many vegetables could ever be a problem mm -hmm. or that too many vegetables at the exclusion of meat and organs could be a problem. So you, people are not going to get answers. And that's what's so in interesting to me. And I think it's it's one of the things that is so important, makes me feel like I need to keep talking about this, that vegetables are not great for everyone mm -hmm. and more vegetables is not always better for everyone. And how interesting in your case that it was two to three years where you felt okay, you felt good, and then mm -hmm. things kind of fall off the cliff. I've heard of this time frame so often. It seems like yeah. humans must have, I mean, from you know 16 years of eating probably a, a standard Australian diet, you had some nutrients in your body and then it takes two to three years and then they eventually you become nutrient deficient in a massive way and things really start to be problematic. Yeah. Yeah. I truly believe that you have these stores and eventually the stores run out. And exactly. <laughs> you know, that's why this video that I created went so, so viral because I just had thousands of people telling me like, I've, I've, this is my story. This is what I've experienced. And yeah, maybe it is anecdotal, but you can't deny how many people are uh, coming out and sharing this. <laughs> and this. Yeah, this is true. And this is the problem. I think this is a challenge with where we are today in, in the health landscape is that if there's not a randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled trial, mainstream physicians won't take things seriously. Mm. But for me and for you, we probably hear hundreds 
of anecdotes a day from people and there's something going on there. Yeah. And they may be anecdotes of like, oh, I incorporated liver and I felt better or I incorporated meat and I felt better or I got rid of vegetables and my acne got better or, or I stopped birth control and this got better. So it's, mm -hmm. it's so interesting. I think that there's so much value in anecdote and it gets discounted so often. It should make us very curious and I, I hope that it spurs more actual research directed at understanding what's behind those because there's only so many anecdotes that can happen before you think there's something going on here. This cannot mm -hmm. all be chance, right? It's crazy. Yeah. There must be something going on there. So you mentioned birth control. I wanted to talk to you about this too because... Mm -hmm. Oh, I got sucked in as a teenager, didn't <laughs> I? The vegan, the birth control, the climate change. Uh, uh. So what was your experience with birth control? <laughs> um... I think initially I went to the doctors because my cycles were just really heavy and like uncomfortable and yeah, they just offered Were you <laughs> vegan at the time? Um, or was it before veganism? No, I would have been, yeah, vegan at the time. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Imagine that. Thinking about it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. What a coincidence. Um, yes, yeah, so that was initially why I went on it. And so many people go to the doctors with symptoms for issues with the cycle and they get prescribed pills, but yeah, I got the Implanon in my arm, um, which is so gross thinking about it now. Um, yeah, I basically like ended up losing my cycle. Like I just didn't have a period and I thought it was normal or like they just said that, you know, sometimes it happens with birth control. It's like, oh, okay. Um, and then, yeah, something switched and I realized, wow, this is not natural. <laughs> like... I'm a young, fertile woman and I'm not having a period. Like, why is the doctor telling me that this is normal and this just happens when it's clearly biologically not right? <laughs> and I think that the other piece there that's so striking for me is this is so true. And I've heard this from so many women that you they'll go to the doctor with painful periods or irregular periods or something with their cycle, probably related to a food thing, mm. right? So the wrong types of foods causing some sort of inflammation and causing hormonal issues. And the answer is birth control. Oh, let's just put a, a hormonal band-aid on this clear symptom that you have an imbalance in your body. That to me is criminal. And if people are not familiar with this, hormonal birth control is either estrogen or progesterone or sometimes both. And basically the period that women will get in quotations mm -hmm. on birth control is an estrogen withdraw period. So if you give a woman estrogen and then you withdraw the estrogen, she will bleed. Mm -hmm. That's not the same as a normal cycling of a female. And this is the point of birth control is that you can both do that to prevent the ovulation by having sort of tonically high estrogen mm -hmm. or progesterone or both. And also it makes women feel better. Like they're getting a real cycle when in fact, there's nothing being fixed at all. It's just this, a very not precise band-aid that we're using to, to make it seem okay. If you're bleeding every month, you're fine. I've got the fix for you. And it's like, wait, no, that's not the answer at all. It's so sad. It's that same disconnect. We're like, we've got the disconnection from our food chain, the disconnect from like the resources that we're using, where they're coming from. And birth control is that disconnect from ourself and our body's natural wisdom. Like you can only get pregnant like four or five days of the month anyways. And so people are still taking these pills to like uh, completely stop uh, the natural physiological process of, of your bleed and of your cycle. And it's just like, so not, natural and it really like breaks my heart because <laughs> you know you hear of women who have been on birth control for like 10 years and then you know suffer issues with like infertility or have have troubles yeah falling pregnant or returning their cycle and it's just like you know if it's taken 10 years to get to that point and it could take 10 years to like reverse out of that and then by that point you're 40 or 50 and it's like it's it's really really heartbreaking yeah this post birth control syndrome is a real thing mm. and i don't know why more quote fertility doctors obgyns mm. are aren't aware of this or, or don't tell women this i mean i have a good friend here in costa rica who was telling me that his girlfriend was on birth control for eight to 10 years. And mm. I think they, they're not ready to have a baby right now, but they want to have a baby at some mm. point in the future. They're getting serious. And she's off the birth control. There's no period. Mm. And like months go by. I think she's maybe three or four, maybe five months off birth control, maybe six and mm. still no period. And so I said, well, like, okay, you guys are doing the right thing. I think they know what to do in terms of food, but I recommended a supplement from hardened soil that has uterus and ovary and uh, fallopian mm. tubes and just trying to get all the organs I could into them. And um, hopefully we'll see what happens there. But it is interesting and scary to think about how long it takes mm. for women to come back from that sometimes. 
I, yes, it is. I was just going to mention that (laughs) Um, because I remember that you did a video on it recently, but there's a very distinct difference uh, on who I was attracted to and what I found attractive when I was a vegan and on birth control versus when I was up it. Really? Very, very clear. Yeah. Was it a certain type of guy? I'm looking at like, I'm looking at your partner over here. <laughs> I I have um all the love and care in the world for my previous partners, but there was a very like uh I was very much attracted to this like feminine, artsy, you know, just someone who wasn't like stepping up and like allowing me to step into my feminine by being that masculine role. I was, yeah, attracted to quite feminine men. Wow. Yeah. And then you met Sunny, who's a very masculine man. <laughs> You're so glad that you met her yeah. when she was off birth control. <laughs> He's giving two thumbs up. <laughs> Did you know this? <laughs> it's so interesting because there there are research studies about this that women on birth control. They gave, they gave women sweaty t-shirts and the women were attracted to men who had different genetics on when they were on and off birth control. And what they found, and then you see this in the animal kingdom too, was that when women are on birth control, they're attracted to men who have sort of similar immune genetics at the MHC, so multiple histocompatibility complex. They're attracted to men that are similar. That's not what you want <laughs> for like long-term viability and strength of the fetus. You want different genetics, Mm. but it makes sense when you're pregnant to be attracted to your partner. Mm. And so women, that's the problem is that women on birth control are sort of tricking their bodies into thinking they're pregnant all the time. Mm. And so if you have a partner who has, you know, once you have a baby inside of you, there's something, and I didn't know this until recently, like some of that baby's genetics are obviously your partner's genetics. And some of that baby's blood is connected with your partner's genetics. And so there must be something evolutionarily where you're attracted to your partner when you've made a child together and you're carrying that child. Mm -hmm. But when you're not pregnant, you want a man whose genetics are different than you. And that when the genetics come together, you recognize somehow women must recognize men that they are sharing a child with, that they are growing inside of them as similar. Mm -hmm. And that's a good thing. But the, the different genetics are what you want when you're trying to make a child with a new man. So that's interesting that you said that. Mm. That's your actual experience. Yeah. To a T. Wow. <laughs> I just, yeah, I really hope that this podcast helps women eat less salad, more meat, more liver, get off birth control yeah. and not go vegan. But that's just a crazy thing. And it's just scary to me how many women are on birth control. Mm. And so when you stopped birth control, did your period come back immediately or how long did it take? Um, I can't remember exactly, but it was a few months. Yeah. And then it came back. Yeah. And did you do anything specific to like encourage that or just the return of the animal foods in your diet? I was, yeah, returning animal foods. I got a birth control. Um, yeah, it was around about that same timeline. Yeah. that I began incorporating animal foods. It's like, clearly something is not right. I'm still experiencing these symptoms. Mm -hmm. And you know, when you get off birth control, things kind of get worse for the hormones regulate and get better. Um, but yeah, it all kind of, happened at once really the uh getting further away from veganism and the birth control and moving towards the more animal-based more organic uh lifestyle Mm -hmm. yeah and with this baby was there like were you how long were you was it hard to get pregnant or was it just like you were fertile and it was like when you were ready baby happens Mm, yeah I firmly believe that they come down when they are (laughs) ready or when they choose to but um yeah I definitely felt um, like my fertility had returned. Like I had a healthy cycle, you know, my periods weren't painful. Um, my mood was stable and there are signs and indicators of good health when your cycle is like appropriate and healthy. And not painful. Like um, you yeah, said, yeah, not painful. That's important for women to know and their women's partners that might be listening to product that periods don't have to be painful for mm. women. Yeah. And going back to the mood, you know, just because you're in a period doesn't mean that you should be so like unstable uh-huh. mentally like, right. you should be able to um go through it it's it's not like a disease it's not an illness it's it's by design perfectly <laughs> and, right and if you are experiencing like extreme mental or physical pain then yeah something's not right something is not right and yeah. if you're if women are listening to this and they're going to their doctors and the doctors are saying it's just a normal part of womanhood <laughs> right that's bullshit it must be right it's yeah, crazy yeah. to think that it's just crazy to think that yeah, it's just, it's so crazy to think and so frustrating for me to think about all of these things that we're told. And this has come up a couple of times in the podcast as humans that are normalized. Mm. Like 
mood swings are normalized. Anxiety, mm -hmm. it's not normalized, but it's, it's like this is a part of life, quote, right? Yeah. It's like, no, like these things are clear signals to us as humans that we're living in a way, dietary, lifestyle-wise, that's out of alignment and it's fixable. That's what I, mm -hmm. I think that was the reason for me that I sort of took a sharp left turn in my career because it, like Western medicine doesn't say it's fixable. Mm -hmm. And I want, I hope that that comes through in the work that I do for people that, to understand that like these things are fixable because mm. that's empowering as opposed to like, you have to take this birth control. You have to take these medications and people are just kind of powerless. Yeah. It's just, it's so frustrating. So, I mean, how do you think we can help people move forward? Like what's next for you? Like, what are you excited about sharing with people in the future? Like, is, mm. is there, do you have any thoughts? I'm asking multiple questions so you can choose whichever one you want. Like, <laughs> Have you thought about like, what's the best way to deprogram people from all this craziness that they're taking in? I mean, you're doing an amazing job at providing resources to people. Thanks. Um, it certainly helped me on my journey, but I'm trying to work out where I, what role I play in and amongst it, it all. Cause I didn't expect to like grow the following that I have now. Like I began posting on TikTok at the beginning of the pandemic. And now my channels are getting between like, 40 to 60 million views a month. That's like a lot of eyes. Um, and I'm not necessarily like um, qualified in the same way that you are as a doctor. So I can just share my experience and what I'm learning. And you don't necessarily need to be a qualified doctor to like share information and resources. Um, but I mean, technology is a tool that can be used for good. And the more that we're able to express and share resources and have these conversations, um, the better I think things like the, the meat documentary is, is, is perfect because I think it's so important to not just be consuming resources that directly affirm your beliefs, but also like seeing what's out there, but can be hard with algorithms when you're just being fed these affirming biases. That's and, tough. Um, it is, it is tough, but yeah, the internet's a great place and I never would have come across your work or the work of like Western price in my immediate circles and, um, yeah, I think about like my parents, for example, who have their beliefs from their time and they weren't necessarily exposed to the internet and all these other alternative views and how that hasn't, you know, maybe allowed them to see the broader horizons, but what's next? Um, well, having a baby is probably next. Yeah, yeah, Being a mom. exactly. That is next. Um, and that's a whole trip in itself. Like how to raise a healthy human. What values do you want to? <laughs> be modeling um it's so crazy it's so crazy becoming a mother <laughs> I, I, I imagine <laughs> it's like i'm so optimistic for the future and that you know positive change is happening and that's why i'm choosing to bring in a child with this world but you know your work is important everyone else there that's sharing developing work is important it's good for people to spend more time on the internet but also get out into nature <laughs> yeah right yeah it's a tough balance mm -hmm. it's a tough balance and i'm still learning how to navigate it all it'll <laughs> do you think at all about like what kind of values do you want to share with your son um like what's what are the things that you guys want to prioritize re-establishing you... that connection to nature mm -hmm. you know so that's really important so we have moved and we've always been living surrounded by nature um <laughs> we personally think like self-sufficiency is super important. We are, you know, collecting passports and creating opportunities for our children. That's why we've come here to Costa Rica to essentially give birth to our child and create more opportunities um, by having a second citizenship here. Um, so that's really important for us. Um, <laughs> it's so it's so interesting because you think back to like hunt together at times, like we had this village and we had this like wisdom and information passed down three people and we don't really necessarily have that anymore <laughs> we don't it, i don't know how to recreate that is it just small communities i mean i think about that like where where i live here in costa rica there's like a small community you know mm. and i can see it i can see the beginning of it it's not perfect but like it's closer to it than i feel in the united states because things are less even though people are more spread out here and that people are not on top of each other there's more of a community mm. but, like ethos here than there is in the United States where people are just so separated. I think it's just because we all rely on each other here in some ways. Like where I live, there's a neighborhood and we all share a similar water supply from the spring. And so if the spring goes out, 
how the neighbors have to talk and say, what's going on at the spring? Why don't we have water? Or mm -hmm. when the power goes out, people will say like, does anybody else have power? Or can I help? It's just, it's just a different vibe, I think, living in the jungle mm -hmm. where humans do need to rely on each other. And I think that's, that's really good. So I see pieces of it here. And I think people are starting to create these intentional communities, but I think that that's a key part of like what, what we need as humans. I, I would venture to say that people living in cities are amongst millions of people that feel so disconnected. Yeah. 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 You're so true. It, yeah. It, it, these, yeah. Costa Rica is very special as well. There's a lot of like, um, holistic, yeah. Intentional community. Yeah. There's a lot of more people like homeschooling as well. And, you know, visiting their farmer, for example, when they want yeah. to get their goat milk and it's like, I don't know how to scale that though. How do you, like, not everyone can move to Costa Rica. No. And I haven't figured this out either. I think maybe there are ways to create the same intention in, in cities. You know, mm -hmm. if people, I think if people are intentional about building communities in cities or intentional about finding their food, I mean, farmer's markets, right? Mm -hmm. There are meat shares, there are co-ops, there are ways to do it in cities. And there are little, dare I say, tribes forming within cities, but people mm -hmm. have to go look for them. What do you think about the fact that um, grass-fed meat and like organic produce, it's not as accessible for everyone because of the, the cost? How can people... Yeah, it's tough. That. <laughs> I think that, I mean, I think that for me, the most important thing is to get animal foods. And then the second thing would be improving the quality of those animal foods. So if people can't afford or don't have access to grass fed meat, I don't want, I don't think that should be an impediment. Mm -hmm. That's a question. That's like a false dichotomy. People always try to ask, like share with me, like, what if somebody can't get that meat? You know, would mm -hmm. you rather eat this meat or vegetables. And I think I'd still rather eat. So if somebody said to me, would you rather eat a hamburger patty from McDonald's mm. or like a bunch of spinach? I would say I'd rather eat a hamburger patty from McDonald's. It's not mm. grass fed, but we've done content on this in the past. Like there's actually no seed oil in the grill and I'd rather eat that meat. And I think, I think McDonald's hamburgers, and this is a dangerous way to say it, but I think like fast food hamburgers could be a, a, an easy entry point for any human. Mm -hmm. They're they're convenient. They're not super cost effective. Although I think when we did the math, it was like seven dollars a pound mm -hmm. for McDonald's ground beef, and you can go to like Target or Walmart and get ground beef for three dollars a pound. So you're definitely paying twice as much, but for the convenience, if you don't even have a stove. But think about how low the bar is for entry of people just eating like fast food hamburgers. Yeah, and if you don't eat the sauce with seed oils, and you don't get the fries that are cooked in peanut oil. Like there's some really, really accessible things for people, even in like very poverty stricken places. You know, I, I kind of want to do this content to go to a city like Austin or something and, and talk to some of the people that are homeless. I think there's probably other issues going on there and just say like, how much money are you able to panhandle in a day? Like, do you get $5? Well, that could buy you like four or five hamburgers at McDonald's, but people aren't going to spend the money on that. They're going to spend it on cigarettes or alcohol or drugs or meth. So it's there. It's just, how do we, I don't know. It's an interesting question though that we should be thinking of. Like mm -hmm. it's there for people, but I think most people are not at that level who, yeah. are, who are listening to this. I think most people are sort of somewhere in between and they, they think about their money and at, at like, a, at like a, let's just say like a, an average level of income for people. I think the question is where do you prioritize your funds mm -hmm. and how much are you spending on cable? How much are you spending on your cell phone? How much do you spend on drinks? And a lot, I think a lot of people have more income that they could commit to higher quality foods if they understood the value proposition, which is what I try to make them curious about. Mm, yeah, that's so true. And you definitely promote like the grounding and the sunlight and things that are easy, things right? That are yeah, accessible to yeah, everyone. Super accessible. And I think that for humans, if we think about nutrients and nutrient density, which is really the, the currency of our health, right? you understood this as a vegan. Like if you don't have nutrient rich food, you can eat a lot of food and you're not getting to be healthy. <laughs> the cost of junk food is much higher than the cost of really good quality food. If you're actually thinking about it in terms of the correct currency, right? Mm -hmm. If the currency is your health and overall nutrient status mm -hmm. and overall nutrient adequacy, red meat, grass fed beef is incredibly affordable. Mm -hmm. It's much cheaper than a chocolate bar. It's mm -hmm. much cheaper than French fries. It's much cheaper than any junk food you can buy. But it's just that I, I think that I need to do a better job or I hope to be able to help people understand that equation better, right? Mm -hmm. But red meat, grass-fed beef is very affordable when you think about what's in there. Yeah. And 
most of us don't think about that. We just think, does it make me full? Do I have enough energy to go to tomorrow? And yeah. well, top ramen is cheaper. Well, but top ramen is pretty expensive when you think about the nutrient. There's no, they're going to spend a lot of money on top ramen to get any sort of, nut- basically you'd spend infinite amounts of money because there's no nutrients, right? Mm. So I think that's always the equation. People think like I can spend $4 to get a, a half pound of grass fed beef, say ground beef, or I can spend $4 and get <clears throat> a bag of laced potato chips. Mm. And I would rather spend it on potato chips. And you think like, well, it's, or I'm, maybe that's not the best one to compare it to. What am I thinking? I don't know. Like a Snickers bar, or mm. you could go to McDonald's and get like a Happy Meal or something. Yeah. A Big Mac, which actually has some meat in it. But the amount of nutrients you'd get in half a pound of pure ground beef versus uh, a filet of fish sandwich at, at McDonald's, mm. there's no comparison, right? Mm. So it's much more expensive to do that. We just don't, I don't think people are calculating that in their head. And it's a, it's a more complicated calculation. Mm. Yeah, yeah. So Those filet of fish sandwiches, man, they're <laughs> fucking up the world. <laughs> you think about the quality of the fish, the seed oils, all that stuff, it's horrible. Mm. So, not for me. Not for you. Oh, I think it's so funny. And it's, 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 I was just thinking back about how you went through your vegan phase as well. And uh, it's, it's very interesting that, that segment of vegans, the, the, the fasting, raw vegan. Like, how did you end up there? How did you end up there? I was a physician assistant, and it shows you. There was essentially zero nutrition taught in PA school. Mm. And I was working in cardiology at the time and I was running a lot. So I was doing like distance running and I wanted to be fast. And it was like a series of books that talked about something that was interesting to me. And there was some idea that like cooking food is bad Mm. and creates toxins. And the fact that you're obviously cooking meat. And then I think I got into like David Wolf, this like kind of, sticky this like vegan guy that's i think is very passionate or used to be very passionate and had the ability to dissuade a lot of people or persuade a lot of people and so i started reading his stuff and so i thought this makes sense i should eat more salads and then i'm i'm just a person that wants to understand the edges of things Mm. so if cooking food is bad and if meat isn't something that we should be eating because we're clearly derived from primates then let's just go completely raw vegan and i'll see how it feels and Mm. of course It didn't work out for me either. I farted a lot. I lost a lot of muscle mass. I didn't feel great in the end. It certainly didn't help my eczema. Thankfully, I only did it seven months, or I think I would have developed more severe nutrient deficiencies and probably problems long-term, maybe with oxalate overload. Mm -hmm. But it was just an experiment. And then I remember the day where I was listening to a podcast from a guy connected with the Institute of Functional Medicine, and he was talking about our book of life and what's written in our DNA. And something just clicked back for me, and I thought, oh, of course it's written in our DNA that we're going to eat meat. Why? What have I been doing for so long? It took, but it took me like six or seven months to figure that out. And there's a lot, of, a lot of really interesting ideas around vegetarian and veganism. I mean, humans are evolved from apes, apparently, chimps and bonobos. Mm. But I think that what I didn't understand at the time was that our brains are very different than theirs. They're much bigger, that there was this evolutionary shift in us, that we came down from the trees, potentially in East Africa, the Rift Valley, and we started walking upright. And that the inclusion of meat in our diet as humans in history was probably one of the key elements that actually allowed our brains to grow and for us to develop a a rich neocortex and to be the functioning humans we are today. Mm -hmm. So this was the piece that was left out. It's like, there's this compelling vegan argument when you think, oh, meat isn't good for us. And then you realize like, wait, I'm not the same as a chimpanzee and my gut looks very different. (laughs) That's hard enough. (laughs) it It was interesting. I think a lot of people make this argument. I mean, there's a there's a, there's a fruit stand here and um, it's a typical Costa Rican fruit stand that I was inside the fruit stand looking up at the ceiling. There's a big banner that says humans are frugivores. It's in Spanish. So it says like humanos somos frugivores or something, you know, like, humans, we are frugivores. And I thought, I don't think we're frugivores. <laughs> I don't think we're supposed to be fruitarian. If you look at like what happens long-term, Humans do not look good as fruitarians. So I just, these type of things were interesting to me. There's a piece of truth there. That's where we've come from, but it just, I wasn't versed enough to understand it, but I went and explored it. And then I, you know, had to come out of it. I wish everyone could meet you in person so they could see how healthy you are. (laughs) How healthy you look. Um, Whereas, yeah, some of the fruitarians and some of the vegans. They don't look too bad. Not so much. (laughs) 
I, I mean, I, yeah, I think the people can feel it. And I, that's what I want. I want people to be curious and to make their own decisions mm. and to be curious and, and to live their lives. And if you want to try veganism, vegetarian, great, but understand that if you don't do well with it long term, which I think mm. you won't, there are other ways to do this. And this came up before the podcast too. And I just want to make this point that there's this sort of other idea, which I think is a little bit dangerous that like, oh, maybe vegan or vegetarianism works for some people, but not for others. And I just don't think that that makes sense to me as a human. Like mm. if you're homo sapiens and you came from homo erectus, homo habilis, australopithecines, we've all, all of us are the same species as far as we know, right? Mm. And we've come from this lineage of humans. We've all had the same gradual changes in our, in our biochemistry, in our liver detoxification systems, in our brain. We all have the same requirements for nutrients. I mean, no matter who you are as a homo sapien, you have a neocortex that is incredibly developed relative to chimps and bonobos and your primate ancestors. And so it doesn't make sense to me. I don't think it's sound to suggest that some people can, with the same stomach and the same enzymatic systems and the same acidity and the same gut transporters, somehow magically um, absorb more nutrients from plant foods than the rest of us, because that's what would have to happen. There have to be this like magical alchemy that happens in the guts of some people where they can get nutrients that don't exist in plant foods, mm -hmm. B12, K2, choline, answering, taurine, creatine, carnitine. Like you have to create those in your gut or have some sort of specialized transporter or biochemical system. It just doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. I think what happens so often, and it's so interesting that you mentioned this to highlight it once more, is that people may feel quote good on a plant-based diet for a few years. And so you see what you see is people proclaiming, I feel great on a plant-based diet. And you're getting this window, this snapshot of people in the first two to three years over and over and over. And then people fall off and they fall off and they fall off. And then you never hear about them again. And the vegan community looks back on them and says they did it wrong. Mm -hmm. And so we're not getting this actual, we're not getting this actual real perspective on on what happens to humans when they're vegan long-term. Mm -hmm. And I'll share my personal conspiratorial perspective that, <laughs> that vegans who claim to be thriving long-term are full of shit. And then, I just don't believe it. Like the hidden camera in their house, I know they're eating salmon. I know, I was just gonna say that. Like I, it, it is anecdotal, but I don't know any long-term vegan that doesn't sneak in like an egg here and there. Right, when, <laughs> right. When they're like getting to that point and they just have a little bit of a chop up and then they can. Yeah, salmon isn't there. really neat. It's okay to eat salmon once in a while. Once in a while. while, I'm a vegan, but I eat salmon once a month, and it's like just enough to like keep them from absolutely cratering. This is what I think happens. <laughs> Hitting camera. Mm, the the, the is... vegan dreams. Have you have you heard about the vegan dreams? Do you dream about meat? Yeah. Oh, really? <laughs> I didn't know this. I just guessed. Because I shared, I shared a video on social media and I said towards the end of my veganism, I started like dreaming of meat and like loving it. And I was just uh, received so many DMs from ex-vegans telling me that like intuitively their body like was sending them signals in their dreams about meat. You you meat. Oh my gosh. So the vegan dreams tends to be quite common. So there's a guy. So I did a podcast a few years ago um, <laughs> with... Elise Parker, who was raw alignment. She was yeah. like a very popular vegan who then went animal-based carnivore and felt way better. Mm -hmm. And she talked about specifically feeling like she was asexual on a vegan diet. She had no libido. She felt like she would just transition to like being completely asexual. And then she realized it was just the lack of nutrients. Mm -hmm. The other guy was Tim Sheaf, who was going to be in the Game Changers. He was a world-class free runner. So like parkour, free runner guy, they filmed him for Game Changers as a vegan. And then his health got so bad that he told them, you cannot put me in Game Changers. He, they couldn't use any of that footage of him in Game Changers. And Tim Sheaf's story of eating meat for the first time is, is probably one of the most viral I've ever heard because he literally had a wet dream. He like <laughs> ate salmon and then went to sleep and just ejaculated. It's like your body is like literally just like, thank God I'm fertile. You know, or I can actually like, like make like semen or, you know, these things. I'm not trying to be crass. It's just actual human fertility. And it, that's crazy to me. It's interesting. It's like, basically these are like vegan craving dreams. They're like, yeah. please, <laughs> can you please go eat some meat? <laughs> oh, it's so funny. I laugh. I laugh. Um, but it is quite sad, but, <laughs> but it is good to have a bit of humor with it. It's sad, but I think that like stories like yours are valuable because it helps people understand mm -hmm. that like there, there are people 
who are being honest about this and have done so much better. I mean, your skin is great now. You're fertile. You've made this baby. You know, you've had a great pregnancy. It's like such a different life than you had when you were a vegan. And it's yeah. interesting to think like, what we hear in the media, red meat is bad for you. More vegetables are good. It doesn't always work that way. In fact, mm. I think it never works that way. So mm. thank you so much for sharing your story. Thanks for having me on. Coming on the podcast. And yeah, I'm excited to meet your son eventually and see what life you guys make here in Costa Rica. Thanks so much for having us. Yeah. <laughs>